Trash, Part 3, Chapter 1 I'm Olivia Weston, and I was what they call a temporary house mother at Bihala's Mission School. I also have one part of the story. The boys and Father Juilliard have asked that I write it down carefully, so that is what I will do. I'm 22, and I was taking time after university to see some of the world. I came to the city intending to stay in it for a few days, get over my jet lag and so of swimming and surfing, my plans changed. I did go swimming and surfing. I did have a holiday. But I found lying on the beach was good for a week, and then I started to feel restless and useless. Bihala had hit me hard, and I couldn't get it out of my mind. I'd gone there to deliver some sponsorship money for my parents, who had a friend who'd worked there. My father works in the foreign office and had paid my airfare and a bit more in the hope I'd get something educational out of the trip. Sure enough, before I knew it, Father Juilliard had suggested I teach reading and writing to the little ones. Then I got involved in a water sanitation project they have going. Then I was doing very basic first aid because the kids are always getting scratched or bitten and things go septic fast. And then I got the title Temporary House Mother, which means you agree to do daytime shifts helping out wherever you can. I fell in love. I fell in love with the eyes looking at me and the smiles. I think charity work is the most seductive thing in the world and I'd, do I'd never done it before. For the first time in your life, you're surrounded by people who tell you you're making a difference. The Bihala children are beautiful, and to see them on the rubbish tips all day can break your heart. If you come to this country, do the tourist things. But come to Bihala, too, and see the mountains of trash and the children who pick over them. It is a thing to change your life. I knew June, the little boy they called Rat. June would not call me Olivia. It was always Sister. And then it became Mother. I am stupidly soft-hearted. I will drip tears over a stray cat back in England. Little June had me wrapped around his finger in about two days, and I was forever giving him little bits of food and little bits of money. I don't know how else a boy like that survives. We have a restroom in the school where people can go when it all gets too much and just lie down under a fan. We've got a small fridge in there, too, and the house mothers use it as a base. June got into the habit of visiting me and trying to make things tidy, and I got into the habit of giving him things. So when he brought his two friends to see me, it was a nice surprise, but I had no idea what I was getting involved in. They asked if we could talk, and I assumed it was about what had happened the night before. Father Juilliard was resting, and I didn't want to disturb him. He'd been up most of the night trying to find out where Raphael had been taken, and I think he was still badly shaken. The police had not been helpful. Then, of course, the child had simply come walking back to Bahala, walking in as the sun rose. I wasn't there, but I'd heard all about it, and I could see how badly he'd been beaten. His auntie had held him and held him and wouldn't let him go. The whole neighborhood came out, apparently. Father Juilliard says the people here are like that. When one of their number is hurt, everyone feels the wound. Now he smiled shyly at me, pulling back his hair. The bruising was terrible, and I remember wondering how an adult could possibly strike such a child. He saw me staring and moved behind his friend. Gardo, the bald boy, put his hand very gently on his arm before turning back to me. June said, We don't know what to do, Mother. We've got a big problem. You know, Gardo. Yes? Gardo sat down, looking at his knees. I could see that he had tried to dress up clean. He looked scrubbed and his t-shirt was fresh. He tried to smile, but he just looked nervous. I was jumping to the conclusion, of course, that he was about to ask for money, and I was bracing myself to refuse. One of Father Juilliard's rules was that we did not give money away as gifts. The odd ten or twenty, yes, everyone did a little bit of that now and then, but I knew Gardo was building up to ask for a big sum. I was surprised then, and a bit ashamed, when he said, my grandfather's in prison, ma'am, and I want to go see him. I said, I'm sorry, which prison? He told me the name, and as I knew nothing about the city's prisons, it didn't mean much, and I wondered why I'd asked the question. Why is he in prison? I said. Gardo looked away, and the bruised boy, Raphael, put his arm around his shoulders and said something in his own language. I realized I had touched on something personal, but I could hardly backtrack now. And in any case, it was one of the logical questions. They say he beat up someone, said June softly, but it's not true. It's all corruption, because there's some men who want his house. 
Gardo, I saw, had started to cry. He wiped his eyes and said, They're trying to get him out of the house. They, f they file a charge. They pay the police. The police arrest him. Now they've got his house. Gardo wiped tears away again. Raphael hugged him harder and said something again, something reassuring, I assumed, in his own language. Then he said to me, Gardo needs to see him, sister. The boy's mouth was swollen and his speech was awkward. Can you help us get to the prison? I took a gulp of water and June topped up my glass. It was dawning on me that I had been right. This was going to be a request for money. They needed bus fares or bribe money. I was surprised again, therefore, when Gardo said, We need you to go with me, sister. Please? Me? They all nodded. You want me to go and see your grandfather, I said. Gardo nodded. How? I said I was completely bewildered. Why do I need to see him? We've got to get some information to him, said Gardo. The police were asking questions about him. That's why they beat my friend. Maybe they come for me next time. I, I don't understand. It's a difficult situation, Mother, said June. I'd never seen him so grave. The old man needs to know what is going on here. We need some information, too, to help him, or he loses the house. But your family, perhaps your mother? Gardo shook her head. his head. No, Mother. Your grandfather must have sons, I said. And there must be visiting times. Why can't somebody just visit? I'm not sure what good I can do. That's the problem. Gardo said, you, you don't understand. You're right, I said. I don't. The prison's here, said June. A visit once a month. Mother, they're going to lose their house. That's everything here. You lose your house, you've got nothing. And you, you're a social worker. Gardo said, you take your passport, you sign your name, they let you inside. I was silent. At last, we would got to the bottom of it. The boy said something I didn't hear and put his head in his hands. June put his hand on mine and said, We ask you because it is so important and no one else can help. You're the only foreigner we know, said Raphael, and the prisons out here, they do what they want. You say you're a social worker, said June. You say you just want to see him for half an hour. They may keep you waiting, okay? They may say no at first, but in the end, if you just sit there, there's a chance, yes? Gardo looked at me, and his eyes were still full of tears. June said, You're the nicest, kindest mother we ever had here. He's only asking because without this, they may be going to lose the house. They beat me, said Raphael. They think I got some papers, but I don't have them. Please, mother? That was how I found myself in a taxi heading for Colva Prison. Vanity and stupidity and the fact that three little boys could break my heart one minute and flatter me the next, all the time lying and lying. I, ju I took just Garda with me, and the first thing we did was stop at a big store to get him some new clothes. He'd cleaned himself up, as I said, but his shorts and shirt were ingrained with so many months' dirt they were stiff on his body. The looks I got walking him into the boys' clothing department were something I'll never forget. And the time it took him to choose was also something I remember. I'd asked the taxi driver to wait, thinking, shorts and shirt, five minutes of shopping. Unfortunately, it wasn't like that. Gardner wanted to take his time, and he was the most intent, careful shopper I'd ever seen. He wanted jeans, and he wanted the most expensive kind. I could not pay Western prices for something that I knew was probably made for peanuts in this very city, so I managed to talk him down to a cheaper pair. Then he wanted a long base basketball shirt, which I thought was totally wrong for the impression we were hoping to create. I took him to a rack with formal shirts on it, and he turned his nose up at all of them. I was beginning to get flustered by now, so again we compromised. We chose a t-shirt, which he insisted must be too big. Then we chose a more formal shirt with a collar to wear over the top. He tried all on, and we went to the checkout, or I thought we were heading that way, but suddenly... I was in the shoe section, and he was looking at trainers. Again, the prices stunned me. But I had to admit that a smartly dressed boy with bare feet, dirty bare feet, is not going to be very convincing. We chose a medium-priced pair, and when we got to the checkout, I put it all on my credit card. The reward, of course, was that I had never seen a boy so happy in my life. And, I have to say, so handsome. He emerged from the changing room, and he was simply no longer a Behala dump site boy. He was a taller, 
He was bursting with confident that or with confidence and smiles. He was even walking differently. I could not resist kissing him, which made the shop assistants howl with laughter. We got to the taxi. I gulped when I saw the meter, and on we went.